This morning, a couple of last things we're going to look at. One, I mentioned last class meeting, office hours next week, finals weeks, they're up on the board there. Our final is on Wednesday, okay, 9 to 11, two hours. I told you about what you can bring and the coverage, what it'll be like, how many problems. Any questions on that right now? Okay, um, I passed out former uh, midterm problems on Monday and Wednesday. If you missed either of those two days handouts, see me after class. I've got them up here in front for you. But I want to go over one problem which had an error in the problem statement. It was labeled problem one. It was on an uh, individual, I think, sheet of paper. Let me make sure about that. No, it was on the staple package. Uh, It had the wrong diameter in the problem. Uh, it gave the outside diameter of five, five centimeters, and it gave the inside diameter of 0.2 centimeters. That was incorrect. It should be two centimeters, not 0.2 centimeters. The solution is correct with two centimeters in the answer, so the answers are correct. It's just the problem statement in words should have said inside diameter two centimeters. The problem involved a heater inserted in a tube. The K value of the tube was given. The heater input was given in Q prime, so many watts per meter. The tube was placed in a large room whose walls were at T surroundings. There was air in the room and the temperature of the air was given T infinity. The surface temperature of the tube was given, actually had a maximum value of given. The emissivity of the tube on the outside surface was given. Oh, there it is twice, okay. These guys are the same, don't need both of those. Let's erase him. Okay, and then let's see, I think that's all we were given. There's no length, it's a long tube. And we were asked first to find the convection coefficient on the outside of the tube, and second, find the hottest temperature in the tube material. Well, <clears throat> we know where the hottest temperature is going to be. Here's the heater. The room temperature is less than the surface temperature, so the hottest temperature is where my fingertip is right there next to the heater. So we're asked for part B. Really, you're asked to find the temperature right there. Okay, so this is a problem, and again, this problem involves chapter one and chapter three. Uh, chapter three, because we can look at some resistances for the tube, for instance. So first of all, to understand the problem, what's happening is the heater is supplying heat. The heat escapes out through the tube radially. So the heat comes out radially by conduction, okay. Then it goes into the room by convection and radiation to the room walls. Okay, so it involves conduction, convection, radiation. Pretty much the three things in chapter one. If you want to, you don't have to, but if you want to, you can draw a circuit if it helps you visualize the problem. This is the temperature of the tube at the heater. We'll call it TH for heater. This is a conduction resistance. Conduction resistance. I'll just put that on there for conduction resistance. The heat supplied by the heater then goes out to the outer surface temperature of the tube. Then it splits. Some goes to the air in the room by convection. 
some goes to the room walls by radiation. Okay, so that's kind of the, the picture, the roadmap, what's going on there. Now you can write the equation down. Don't look at him yet. Look at that side first. The heat supplied by the heater either goes out by convection or by radiation. The prime on the surface area means since we were given the heater output in Q prime, watts per meter, we should use primes here. There's Q prime right there. So R prime conduction. Now, because of the prime, and we don't know L, of course, that means don't put the L in there because you don't know L right there, okay? That's our prime conduction. Okay, so back to here again. What do we know? I know Q prime. I know this. I know this. I know this. I know epsilon this, 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 this. There they are, all the check marks I know. What's the only unknown? H, got it, solve for H, it's there. Part B, the hottest temperature in the tube. Okay, that's the inside of the tube where it touches the heater. Okay, write the conduction equation. Q prime, now, now, look at that side. Okay, I know it, I know it. I know it, solve for TH, right there, got it, I'm done. So you don't need this diagram. Matter of fact, you don't wanna have a resistance for this radiation, it complicates the problem. So don't be tempted, you can, it's possible to find this, but it, it doesn't make for a clean solution. It, it kind of makes it a little more difficult. So this is good for a roadmap of where it goes, all the heat comes in here, it splits and ends up either at the walls or the air. But this is the equation you want to solve for the two unknowns. Yes, sir? Uh, the one that the prime equation on the right side, mm -hmm. you see surroundings to the force? Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. Thanks very much. Good, good. Okay, now, here's maybe a problem. We just finished chapter six, seven, eight, and nine, convection. When you read this, you might be tempted to say, oh, find H, I just did that in chapter seven, eight, and nine. This is a, this is a cylinder, chapter seven, flow over a surface. I can find H from chapter seven for the cylinder. No, don't do that. Then you might say, well, I just finished chapter nine, free convection. I think I can find H from chapter nine. No, don't be tempted. The reason why you can't do that, you could try, but you'd be stuck real quick. Do you know for chapter seven, the Reynolds number? Uh, okay, answer this question. Were you given a velocity of the air in the room? No, okay, can't do it. Chapter seven, no. Chapter nine. Do you know the Rayleigh number? Uh, did the problem say, this assembly is in a room where the air is quiescent or still, calm? No, no such words in the problem. No, not chapter nine. So you can convince yourself, I can't, I can't use chapter seven, chapter nine. I don't know the velocity. Is the velocity zero? That's chapter nine. Is the velocity 10 meters per second? That's chapter seven. Since the velocity wasn't given and the conditions of the air in the room were not given, you say, no, this is not a chapter seven, eight, nine problem. This is a chapter one problem. The basic equations, chapter one, small object, large room, chapter one, it's really chapter three, chapter three, conduction, it's a chapter three, one problem. But just so you know, <laughs> make him two centimeters. Okay, any question on that one then? Um, if you have any questions on these problems that I passed out to review for the final, these previously um, assigned, they were problems from previous midterms, uh, see me after class or office hours fine too. 
we're going to finish today about 15 minutes early. So he thought, people that couldn't make my office hour at the time I had, if you want to see a face-to-face -face meeting with questions you've got, hang on after class and I'll be here for the rest of the class period to answer any questions you have. Well, we're going to end up here with a couple of interesting little scenarios on heat transfer and everyday life kind of in a way. But I'm going to go back to history first. Um, we, Cal Poly is part of its history is in Pomona Valley. But before homes were built back in the early 1900s, 1930, 40, 50, even in the 60s, there was lemon and orange groves everywhere here from Pasadena to San Bernardino. They grew lemons and oranges and trees, groves and groves of trees, not many homes before the homes came. And matter of fact, you know, Pomona, what the Greek goddess of agriculture, that's where it got his name because there was so many fruit trees here, stone fruit trees, um, peaches, things like that, plums, because they needed cold nights. And Pomona had cold nights in the winter. Not so much citrus, more stone fruit. Well, anyway, on the foothills, San Dimas, um, Laverne, Azusa, Upland, Claremont, those cities had citrus groves. And of course, the citrus groves, <laughs> they were a big money maker. They shipped the fruit back east on railroad cars at that time. And the uh, oranges or the lemons were in the trees, and quite a bit of them were, you could see them. You could see the yellow lemons, you know, or the orange oranges. You could see the fruit on the trees. Well, all is good, except in the winter here, before we had asphalt and concrete and homes, it was colder here in the wintertime because we didn't have that thermal effect from the uh, homes and the concrete streets and the asphalt streets. So the, the story goes, and you can Google it, it's fun to Google it. I did it and it's just, it's overwhelming, There's so much material about it. But the owners of the Grove and, and the superintendent of the Grove who had to monitor the Grove, they were worried in the winter, particularly December, January, February, they were worried about a cold snap and that fruit freezing. Because if that fruit gets down to, um, well, I'll tell you what it says here. If the outside temperature is 28 degrees for two hours, the fruit's damaged. You're not gonna sell damaged fruit for what, it, what it's worth. If you go five hours below 26 degrees, you can destroy a year's crop. So these guys were really worried about that temperature. So the story goes that they would at night, early evening, listen to the radio, and the radio had the forecast. The forecast for tonight is um, cold temperatures and clear sky. Oh, they hated to hear those words. Oh, the two worst words. Cold temperatures and clear skies. You don't want clear skies. You want cloudy skies. Clear skies. Boy, that really worried them. So they called the crews out. Okay, guys, go out there and light fires in the grove. Well, they just didn't go out and burn wood in the grove. They built a special thing. Okay. That's called a smudge pot for a good name. Smudge pot. Matter of fact, I think a couple of football teams, I forget, San Dimas and whatever, they had the smudge pot bowl. The winner got the smudge pot. Crazy. It's a round thing about this round. It sits on the ground, it's about that high. And it, it, you pour oil in it. And it's got a, a stack, a smokestack coming out the top. And, and so they put these things in the groves along the, the aisles in the grove. And then if they had this bad news about clear skies and cold temperatures, the crew would run out there at night and they would have a lighter and they'd light all the smudge pots in the grove. And so, they didn't buy the best oil. They bought, of course, the worst oil. And that, for a reason, too. For a reason, not just economics. So, this oil's burning. It's not going to explode. It's not gasoline. It's oil. It burns. And out the stack comes this black cloud. Okay. Now, here's the problem. A clear sky, those oranges or lemons, what do they see? They see black sky up there. 
If you're out in space, what's the temperature of black sky? It's getting close to zero, Kelvin. Because of the atmosphere, it's not the same here on the surface of the Earth, but it still sees a black sky. So these oranges or lemons are radiating heat out to that black sky. So even though the air temperature is 31 degrees, the orange temperature might be 28 degrees, a few degrees colder. That's going to destroy the crop. So they say, oh, gee, that black sky is a problem. I'm going to try and create a cloud over the grove. Yeah, OK, good idea. So let's burn oil. OK, so they have the smudge pot here with the stack. And they, they light it, and they create, of course, an artificial. It's, it's warm, so it rises over the top of the trees. And now, what does the orange see? A warm, dark cloud. It's not black. It's, it's a warm cloud. And that reduces the radiation heat transfer to the black night sky. It also raises the temperature of the air in the grove. Yeah, it does that, too. It does two things. But the neat part is the radiation part of that. It creates an artificial cloud over the grove. And they did that for tens and tens of years until, of course, more people moved to the inland valleys. San Dimas and Azusa and Claremont and Rancho Cucamonga. And people start going, <coughs> <coughs> oh, yeah. Respiratory problems, bad, bad problems, children, older adults, etc. And the more people moved in there, he said, hey, stop doing that. It's causing us really bad health problems here in the inland valleys. We got a bad name for ourselves out here, as you know, because of that stuff like that. So I said, okay, we'll start burning cleaner fuel. Yeah, you can do that, but of course, the dirty stuff creates a nice cloud. The cleaner the stuff you burn is, you don't, you don't get that nice cloud as much. But they did that. And then more people moved out here. And, and they said, no, don't even burn that stuff. It's not good for our health. Get rid of it. So they said, OK, all right. We won't do that anymore. We're not going to burn it anymore. But I'm still worried about my fruit. Because if it's, if it's destroyed, I can't put it on a rail car and ship it back to Chicago and Cleveland and Cincinnati to sell. It's worthless. So somebody said, well, you know what you ought to do? My uh, nephew got a degree from Cal Poly Pomona in, uh, in uh, mechanical engineering. And um, he took a fluids class. And, and I remember he said, if I have this big fan here, oh, great. Because what happens in these foothill communities? I'll tell you what happens is the cold air runs down the mountain to the lowest point. And Pomona's 800 feet above sea level, it's low. And so it runs down the mountains, the cold air, and it settles down here. So it's cold down here, it's warmer up here. So this fan is gonna create a mixing effect. It's gonna take that cold air near the ground and push it up and the warm air above and push it down and the average temperature then goes up where maybe my fruit crop won't be damaged. So <laughs> that's the fluid mechanics solution. This is a heat transfer fluid solution over here, okay? So, yeah, it's interesting how these things develop with time. And, of course, the, 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 the fans, they don't pollute the air, obviously. So there's, you'll see the problem is these guys are not cheap. This guy is dirt cheap. These guys are not cheap. So can you afford it? Is your grove big enough? Not five acres. No, you won't, you won't spend the money for a big turbine wind power generator, no. So again, just interesting facts about the history of our local area around here. Now, let's take another example. And this one's going to be uh, you may have been camping and uh, the ground and maybe Big Bear, Mammoth, Mountain of Sierra Nevada, wherever, up in the mountains. 
and uh, maybe it's middle September and you, you're going to go up there and camp and maybe you might have a little pup tent or maybe you're going to just sleep out with no tent uh, above Bishop, California, that area, Lone Pine, Big Pine, blah, 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 all those communities. And then so it, in September, it starts to get cold at night. I mean, you know, relatively cold in California, okay. It gets down, you know, 30, 35, 40 at night, depends where you are, the elevation and so on. And, and so you're camping out there with your friends and you have a nice dinner that night, the fish you caught and da-da-da, some nice bread from the bakery in town and so on and so forth. I've done that many times. We used to have a group of Emmy faculty who would go up there every year and backpack into the Sierras for a week. Anyway, yeah, September, it gets a little risky. And of course, by October, it's even worse. So you think, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. Let's just sit around and talk for a while. So, um, Bill, would you go down that ravine and bring back some firewood? I, there's some dead wood down there. So he runs down there and brings back big bushels of firewood. He said, okay, here it is, bloom. Okay, I'm gonna build a fire now. So people start building this fire. They stack the firewood. You gotta do it just right, otherwise it's not gonna burn good. So you know that these guys know how to stack firewood. And then you light the thing and you've got this big flame here and everybody's standing around saying, oh yeah, this is great. I can face the fire and then I'll turn this way and oh, that's wonderful, I love that, okay. Um, yeah, uh, and then about, you know, there's also a story here that's interesting is that <laughs> Uh, if you've got groups of campers in this campground, it's always a game they play, like who can build the highest flame fire? You know, like, I want a flame higher than my head. And the guy over here says, hey, look at his fire. It's bigger than ours. Put more wood on our fire. Yeah, it's kind of one-upsmanship, you know, who has the biggest fire in the campground? So anyway, the fire starts to burn down, and now you've got a pile of ash. Bill, the fire's going down. Go, but go down there, this other ravine. There's more firewood down there. Bill runs down there, comes back more wood, piles it on there, big fire again for 45 minutes, an hour. Fire goes down. So, okay, guys, I think it's time to get in the sleeping bags. Let's make a run for it. Get that last bit of heat. Oh, that's good. One, two, run for the bag. Okay. 1 a.m. Oh, man, it's getting cold in here. I should have bought that more expensive sleeping bag. Yeah, but you didn't. <laughs> We had a member of our faculty and we backpacked with him. He was so funny. He was a real outdoorsman. This guy, we would not even do this. Do not attempt this, it's not worth attempting this. He would get a, a granite boulder about the size of a grapefruit and he put that close to the fire and get that thing really warm. And he, he brought on newspaper for backpacking. You, you're shaking your head, why? Oh, I, I know okay, yeah, yeah, okay. He'd take, he'd take sticks and get that thing out and roll it on the newspaper and quickly, I mean quickly, wrap it up in newspaper, like 10 sheets of newspaper. You know what causes a fire. <laughs> you need oxygen. You need the temperature. You need fuel. You cut the oxygen out, it's not going to burn. He wrapped that thing up so tightly, it didn't burn the newspaper. <laughs> then he'd take this newspaper with the granite rock inside and he'd put the sleeping bag down by his feet and jump in. Oh no, none of us was thought, no, you're crazy, what are you doing? But no, next morning it was fine. He, he had a nice warm feet all night long. Don't do that, don't do that, bad. But anyway, yeah, so, you know, the problem is the fire keeps going out. So then somebody who had heat transfer, must have been a mechanical engineer, said, you know what? I think that if we roll some granite boulders this big, come here, Joe, help me, we roll over by the fire. And so we roll these granite boulders by the fire. So here's one of them here, and then one over here. Ooh, energy storage. It's a battery. It's going to store thermal energy. That granite boulder gets warm because that fire's radiating heat besides a little bit of convection, but most of the convection goes up because of the buoyancy effect but the flame stores its, some of the radiant energy in the granite boulder. 
And then the fire goes out and there's a pile of ash here. No more flame, pile of ash. Ash doesn't radiate too much heat, a little bit, but not too much. So then what you do is you put your sleeping bag close to that rock. And all night long, of course, that rock has been exposed to that flame for five hours. And all night long, that rock is radiating heat, not convection so much at all. No, it's radiating heat to your sleeping bag. Oh yeah, thank you very much. It's called energy storage. Just like now with a solar collector. Once the sun goes down, you gotta find storage for that collector. Then somebody had an idea, well, this was before, you know, can we bring that fire in the house? Yeah, you can do that. You, okay, here's, here's a fire, okay, here's outside. Here's the uh, inside family room. And here's the uh, mantle. And here's my fire. And uh, my fire. Now we're we're talking about people that use a fireplace to heat their home, not just for the cosmetic effect. Like, I like to see a fire in my fireplace. I know it's 75 outside, but I want to see a fire in a fireplace. No, that, that's not to heat your home. That's, that's cosmetic. Yeah, it's Thanksgiving. I don't care in Southern California if it's 75 out there. I want a fire when my guests come in and say, look at that pretty fire in a fireplace for Thanksgiving or Christmas or whatever, New Year's. It, it, forget that. This is for people that need that for heat. In Minnesota, and I love you guys in Minnesota, and northern New York, and Maine, and da-da-da-da-da. They use a fireplace to heat their home, to supplementally heat their home. So, you bring it in the house, and, and, and this is not good because uh, there's no place for the smoke to go out except in your family room, you think, oh gee, I can't build a fire in my house. Ruin my furniture, my walls, my ceiling. No, you know what, I'll put a hole in my ceiling. That's what I'll do. I'll put a hole in the ceiling. And then I'm hoping that with the hole in the ceiling, the fire goes straight out this opening in my ceiling. Yeah, great idea, great idea. So now you've got this, and of course there's a wall around there. And you, and you put the logs in there just like over here, and it burns for a couple hours, and then it goes out. You say, oh, I gotta put more fire in a fireplace. Okay, put more wood in there. It goes for a couple, three hours, and it goes, that's a big pile of ash in the fireplace. And you think, oh gee, now we're gonna go, we're gonna go to bed tonight. I wanna keep this house warm, but I don't wanna get up at 2 a.m. and put more wood in the fireplace. No, you don't. Just like out here, no, you don't. You want to find some way to store that thermal energy so it lasts through the night. If this is like maybe in your bedroom uh, as opposed to in your family room, whatever. Okay, matter of fact, you can do the family room. It'll still heat the house. Doesn't matter. Well, um, you also, you don't want to burn the wall board, the studs and the stuff and the wall board out here. You don't want to burn that. So what you do is you line this guy with fire brick. Fire brick. It can take the heat. It can store the heat. So now the purpose of the fire becomes not just to look nice and to temporarily heat the room for a few hours, but now it's to heat the house all night long. Because if you get that fire brick heated and then you're down after it goes out to a pile of ash here, oh yeah, there it is. This heat goes out of the fireplace by radiation because the fire brick is hot. That's the purpose of the fireplace. 
not to make the pretty fire for you. It's to find a way to store the heat from the burning wood so it lasts all through the night. So again, the same thing. Um, radiation heat transfer, thermal energy storage, convection heat transfer. No, you don't want that because you don't want any smoke coming out of this guy. Some people actually put a glass here to keep the smoke in there and so kids won't play in the fire, blah, blah, blah. So that's okay, but that, but that glass might stop some radiation, some radiation from going into the room. So you gotta be careful you don't overdo it that way. So again, just some common things that people, they do that, they, they're, they're not engineers, they just know what to do about how to store energy um, of a fire or a solar energy. That's the important thing. One time we had a student in a senior project wanted to store thermal energy from a solar collector, an air collector, air collector. So he, um, he had a fan, so the air blew in this 55 gallon drum, this big around, this tall. He loaded the, the drum with granite rocks. They're about as big as a grapefruit size. He found them in the stream bed somewhere don't ask questions, and put him in his truck and brought him down here and loaded up this 55 gallon drum with that rock. And, and then, then he, the fan turned the fan on uh, from the solar collector. The hot air comes through there and goes up and out. And the point being daytime, that heat from the solar collector, the hot air, heats the granite boulders. And then at night, you reverse the flow and take the heat out of the granite boulders. And he did a senior project on it and pretty successful, pretty cute. But it wasn't big enough to really make a, like a house because it was only a 55 gallon drum. He needed something bigger than that to store energy for the night. But it, it proved a concept. It proved the concept to him. So kind of a neat, neat thing.